Hey there, thanks for stopping by. As you can see here, the arcade machine, I'm having trouble getting to it. Um, still not finished. I have one more video to go to finish this off and then I'll post that. If you're curious how I got to this point, I have part one, part two, part three of how I got this far. I've just got to do the finishing touches, do the final mounting, and then we'll actually have a complete machine. Life's gotten in the way. I have trouble getting back to it to finish this off, but I will get there. Today's video, not about the arcade machine, but it's about astrophotography and trying to get pictures of the Milky Way. Um, I'm far from an expert, but uh, I'm just gonna this video, I'm gonna go through the process, what I did, show you my results. Uh, hopefully for some of you that are wanna try it yourself, it'll get you started. Hope you stick around, watch the video, hope you learn something, hope you enjoy something. If you like it, know somebody else might get enjoyment, please pass on the video. Now let's get upstairs into the confuser and I'll show you what I did. All right, here we are up in the office. Originally, when I first uh, embarked on this project, my plan was to take pictures of the Perseid meteor showers. Um, turned out we were going camping right around the right time. Uh, we got there, and of course, the two nights where the Perseids were peak, total clouds. So that went out the window, had to settle just for the Milky Way. So that's what I ended up doing in the end. Uh, we went camping here, Gold Creek Campground. Here, come on a little closer into the computer here. No, no, a little bit, get right in there. There we go. All right, if you're planning on some nighttime photography of the stars and Milky Way, um, first thing you gotta do, get out of town. No, seriously. Further away you can get from a city center, uh, the better your, your pictures are gonna be. Light pollution is your enemy. We happened to be going camping, so our location was fixed. Dates were fixed. I just had to deal with what I had. We're going camping at Gold Creek Campgrounds, you can see on the screen there. So ahead of time, I consulted a light pollution map, www.lightpollutionmap.info. You can check that out. You can find any location in the world, and then you can see how much light pollution you have. You can see from the map here where I live in uh, Porcupine there, I'm in the red zone, one sort of one step below the worst place to take nighttime pictures. Now, if I uh, take a look at where we're going camping, we're out in the, the light green zone. So we're kind of on the edge there. It's not too bad. You'd really prefer to get out into the blue or the, uh, the no color at all zone there to get the absolute best pictures. But in the green zone, I figured I can get a half decent picture of the Milky Way, if not the best picture, but at least good enough to try something out. Here's a picture of our campsite. And here's a picture exactly above our campsite. Not exactly perfect to see the stars. Way too many trees. Although the trees are fantastic to keep a cool campsite when it's 30 degrees in the sun, so great place to come camping. Our campsite exactly, not the best for starry night pictures. Fortunately, just a two minute walk down the path, there happens to be a small field for kids to go play frisbee and whatnot. Voila, a view of the sky, right by the bathrooms and the showers, but you take what you can get. You can see there's a bit of smoke from the campfire, so I was crossing my fingers that, that night it would kind of blow away and it would give me a clear view of the sky. So now I had a place to take the pictures with a view of the sky, now decide when. I camped out in the middle of this field around 10 o'clock at night, middle of August, plenty dark enough to get started. I could vaguely see the Milky Way with my eyes. It was a little bit difficult because of the fluorescent lights from the bathroom building, but not too bad. If I shielded my eyes from the building, they would adjust and I could see the faint smudge in the Milky Way. I have bad eyes and my daughter could see it much clearer and thus she was feeling very superior to me at the time. I get no respect. I used an app on my phone called Photo Pills ahead of time, so I knew exactly where I should expect to see the Milky Way. This app is well worth the, what, $10 it is for all the features it has. Check it out if you get a chance. The nighttime AR feature is what I really like the most, but you should really check it out for yourself and consider the few bucks. No, I'm not sponsored. Wish I was. Anyone want to sponsor me? I could be bought. Anyone? If you're on a computer, uh, Stellarium is a fantastic resource. You install this in your computer, you set any time and place in the Earth, and it shows you what you'll see in the dark skies, including Milky Way, constellations, meteor showers, the ISS, satellites. It's like Google Maps for the sky, really. Again, no sponsorship here. All of this in Stellarium is free. The only thing it doesn't do is predict the weather. Clouds will kill what you can see at night every time. Now let's talk about the setup you need, camera and lens and so forth. Almost any decent camera will do, as long as you can have manual control over the settings, the aperture, ISO, shutter, focus. 
I imagine any camera that is high enough level that gives you the manual control over everything and lets you shoot in RAW will likely be good enough for night and star photography. I used my Fuji X-H1, love this camera. I used to have a Canon T5i and it would have done just fine as well, although the Fuji is much better for noise at the higher ISOs. As for the lens, you want to use the fastest lens you have. Typically, for good Milky Way photos, it's recommended you have an f2.5 lens or faster. You want to be able to collect as much light as possible as fast as you can. The faster the lens, the better you are. I don't have an f2.5 lens. I have a 10mm to 25mm f3.5 lens, so I use this one at the widest angle and the aperture wide open. If you have a faster lens, then you won't need as high of an ISO and you have less noise in your image. I'm a big fan of using whatever equipment you have and trying to get as good of images as you can with it. However, in the case of nighttime photography, a better lens camera combination may result in better final images. But they're not necessary to capture the images themselves. So try this out with whatever you have before spending your money on new equipment. Tripod. <laughs> of course, a tripod. When taking 30 second or longer exposures, of course a tripod is absolutely necessary. And a chair. And warm clothes and maybe a Netflix shows preloaded on your phone, or podcasts at least, especially if you're taking a sequence of images for time lapse or star trails. Once you're set up, you let the camera snap away and you just wait for an hour or more. I waited for about an hour and a half for the sequences at the end of this video, 10.30 till about midnight. The camera settings. So you found your spot and you're there at the right time, it's dark and you're ready to shoot. What settings do you use? It will vary a bit from night to night, spot to spot, depends on how much light pollution there is and how fast your lens is. Here's what I used. Focus. Typically, you want to focus your lens at infinity. Most lenses actually focus a bit past infinity. I'm not sure what past infinity means. A discussion for another time. Anyways, usually you will focus your lens as far out as it'll go and then back off the focus ring just a little bit. How much depends on the lens itself. Try some test shots and zoom in as close as you can on your LCD to see how sharp the stars are. My Fuji, in manual focus mode, shows the focus point on a sliding rule and a blue area that shows the depth of focus. I send my center focus distance a bit shy of infinity, and then I get some of the trees and other stuff that's closer in focus as well. Once you find your focus, you may want to add a piece of masking tape to your focus rings. A little tip I heard from somebody else. This depends on your lens, but some focus rings may move very easily and actually slip while you take images. A piece of tape could give you peace of mind. In fact, I needed this on my T5i kit lens, not so much with the Fuji lenses I have now. F-stop. Easy. You want as much light as possible, so open your lens up as much as it will go. That'd be 3.5 for me. Shutter speed. To keep the stars sharp, you can't have the shutter open too long, or you will start to see the stars as lines, or short little dashes, instead of points. Photo pills can help you with this calculation to determine what your max shutter speed can be. A rough guide, the 500 rule. 500 divided by the focal length of the lens in millimeters. And that is the longest shutter speed you should use. 500 divided by 10 millimeters in my case results in a 50 second exposure, which is what I used. I should note that not all stars move at the same speed. I bet you no one ever told you that past, nobody told me. I had to figure this one out for myself, but it does make sense. Maybe most people don't need to be told this and it's obvious. Anyway, the closer to the North Star they are, the less distance they will move in the sky. The North Star hardly moves at all, which is why it's called the North Star. Duh. Take a look at these. This was taken from my backyard. Not a lot of stars due to the light pollution. But you can see the stars close to the North Star move just a little bit. Stars further out moved a lot more in the same amount of time. Here's another example at a different campsite last year. This is about half hour of images stacked. North Star is still a dot. Well, these stars created quite the streak. This means that if you're zoomed in close to the North Star, you could probably use slightly longer shutter speed than the 500 rule suggests. Further away from the North Star, you probably want to use a shutter speed less than the 500 rule suggests. Okay, ISO settings. Now you have your f-stop, focus, and shutter speed. You can adjust your ISO to get the best exposure. Some trial and error here. Practice a few shots and zoom in to see the results. Lower ISO will give you less noise, but higher ISO will capture more faint stars in the Milky Way. I ended up at ISO 3200. When you're considering your exposure, you probably want to expose further to the right if you can. Get your images bright as you can to get as much information into the camera. 
That way, when you're post-processing, you can darken it down and you won't be affected so much by noise. Last point on settings, shoot in RAW. Of course, always shoot in RAW. Who isn't shooting in RAW these days? And at the highest quality, your camera can. No compression or perhaps the lossless compression, which is what I use. Even though you're in RAW, sometimes the camera will still compress the images to make the file sizes smaller. You don't want compression in this case. You want to maintain as much information in your images as possible. All right, got your camera set up, you're all focused. Now take the shots. You've now got your settings, tripod set up, your image is framed, and now you can take the shots you want. In my case, I wanted to do a time lapse, so I needed to take a lot of pictures. My Fuji has an intervalometer built in. I tell it to take pictures as fast as it can, and it will keep going until the batteries run out or I stop it. You can buy external intervalometers if your camera doesn't have one, or you can make your own, which is what I did for my previous Canon setup. This is what my old intervalometer looks like. It has a small microcontroller inside that watches when you close the shutter. You take one picture and it starts timing. You take a second picture, it remembers how long it took you between those two pictures and takes over and just continues that pattern. A few extra notes. Since you'll be taking lots of pictures, you'll need to be concerned with battery life. The battery life on the X-H1 is kind of terrible. This is the one thing that my old Canon was much better at. For this evening, I used the battery grip which adds two extra batteries to my Fuji. Three times the battery life. In fact, I could plug in the grip to the charger as well if I had AC power, and the camera would stay powered forever. I find that the three batteries will last for about three hours of continuously taking pictures at night. You don't want to be changing batteries once you've started your intervalometer, as you will miss some time and get a skip in your time lapse. The second thing you may run into, especially if it's cold out, is that your lens may start to fog up as the temperatures drop and the environment passes the dew point. If you're going to get serious about this, you can buy lens warmers to keep your lens warm so it doesn't fog up. I'm not serious, so I don't have one. If it gets that cold, I'm going inside to warm up. All right, we've arrived at the point in the video where I'd like to answer some viewer mail. Maybe some viewers have questions or whatnot. What's that? Nothing? We don't have any viewer questions or mail at this time. <sighs> all right, taking all the pictures. Now it's off to post-processing. Here's one of the raw images I took. Not bad. You can see the stars, the Milky Way faintly. Some processing in Lightroom can help bring out the detail and color in the Milky Way. Here are my global adjustments I used. If you're only after single frame, then you could add some local adjustments to further bring out the Milky Way. I've decided to use only global adjustments as I'm using these for a time lapse. I don't want to have to make these local adjustments to every single frame. If you zoom in on one of the raw files, you'll see a bunch of noise due to the high ISO. Not sure how this comes through on YouTube. I've used Lightroom's noise sliders to help with this. You can also use multiple frames, align the stars and overlay them to help reduce the noise. So the noise gets averaged out over the number of frames. There's software available to help with this process called Sequitor. Here's the original, and here's the five frames averaged. Some Photoshop work will need to be done as the trees get smudged as the software rotates the image to line up the stars. But you can see the noise level is much reduced. Here are a couple of YouTube videos from Lonely Spec that can help you with your star editing. I'm far from an expert. I followed all the tips in these videos. First, how to post-process Milky Way astrophotography in Adobe Lightroom, a tutorial. Second, Milky Way exposure stacking with manual alignment noise reduction in Adobe Photoshop. Watching this video will walk you through the process so you understand what's going on. Sequitur tries to do most of this all for you automatically but you can do it manually yourself in Photoshop. I got these links from my buddy Ellen at one of our photo club meetings. Thanks, Ellen. No problem, Steve, glad to share. Ellen was trying some star images herself and that resulted in this beautiful image. I really like how she was able to capture the star field, the misty clouds over the lake. The inclusion of the lit up tent and the trees on the right really give the image a sense of place. Great job, Ellen. Oh, thanks, Steve. 
Also for my photo club, Anita had a similar ideas with the tent and the star field. Ooh, you're going to show my image too? You betcha, Anita. I tell you the truth, I think both Ellen and Anita's images have more interest than the ones I ended up with. Great job, ladies. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Steve. After editing some of my images, I turn this, straight out of camera, into this after edits. I think the editing helps to bring out some of the colors in the sky and the Milky Way stands out a little more. So after editing, I applied all these edits to all 117 images in a few different ways. You can combine them all into one image and get some star trails, or you can play them in sequence to get a time lapse of the sky in Milky Way. The following few seconds are the end result of two hours of sitting in the cold and several hours of editing. watching hope you learned a thing or two hope you enjoyed it if you got something out of the video please feel free to give me a thumbs up subscribe so you get to see my next video maybe get to see when I finally finish this arcade cabinet if there's no somebody else who might enjoy this pass it on if you have any comments questions leave it down the doobly-doo I think that's about it we'll see you next time Nick the Steve out